Chapter 2. In the train for Southampton, morning papers, the new Loxley Hall, past and present, the Moselle, heavy weather, the petrol, the Azores. The last week in December, when the year 1886 was waning to its close, I left Waterloo Station to join a West Indian mail steamer at Southampton. The air was frosty. The fog lay thick over city and river. The Houses of Parliament themselves were scarcely visible as I drove across Westminster Bridge in the heavy London vapour, a symbol of the cloud which was hanging over the immediate political future. The morning papers were occupied with Lord Tennyson's new Loxley Hall and Mr Gladstone's remarks upon it. I had read neither, but from the criticisms it appeared that Lord Tennyson fancied himself to have seen a change pass over England since his boyhood, and a change which was not to his mind. The fruit of the new ideas which were then rising from the ground had ripened, and the taste was disagreeable to him. The day which had followed that August sunrise had not been August at all, and the beautiful bold brow of freedom had proved to have something of brass upon it. The use and wont England, the England out of which had risen the men who had won her great position for her, was losing its old characteristics. Things which in his eager youth Lord Tennyson had despised, he saw now that he had been mistaken in despising, and the new notions which were to remake the world were not remaking it in a shape that pleased him. Like Goethe, perhaps he felt that he was stumbling over the roots of the tree which he had helped to plant. The contrast in Mr Gladstone's article was certainly remarkable. Lord Tennyson saw in institutions which were passing away the decay of what in its time had been great and noble, and he saw little rising in the place of them which humanly could be called improvement. To Mr Gladstone, these revolutionary years had been years of the sweeping off of long intolerable abuses and of awaking to higher and truer perceptions of duty. Never, according to him, in any period of her history, had England made more glorious progress, never had stood higher than at the present moment in material power and moral excellence. How could it be otherwise when they were the years of his own ascendancy? Metaphysicians tell us that we do not know anything as it really is. What we call outward objects are but impressions generated upon our sense by forces of the actual nature of which we are totally ignorant. We imagine that we hear a sound and that the sound is something real which is outside us. But the sound is in the ear and is made by the ear and the thing outside is but a vibration of air. If no animal existed with organs of hearing, the vibrations might be as before, but there would be no such thing as sound, and all our opinions on all subjects whatsoever are equally subjective. Lord Tennyson's opinions and Mr Gladstone's opinions reveal to us only the nature and texture of their own minds, which have been affected in this way or that way. The scale has not been made in which we can weigh the periods in a nation's life or measure them one against the other. The past is gone, and nothing but the bones of it can be recalled. We but half understand the present, for each age is a chrysalis, and we are ignorant into what it may develop. We do not even try to understand it honestly, for we shut our eyes against what we do not wish to see. I will not despond with Lord Tennyson. To take a gloomy view of things will not mend them, and modern enlightenment may have excellent gifts in store for us which will come by and by but I will not say that they have come as yet. I will not say that public life is improved when party spirit has degenerated into an organised civil war, and a civil war which can never end, for it renews its life like the giant of fable at every fresh election. I will not say that men are more honest and more law-abiding when debts are repudiated and law is defied in half the country, and Mr Gladstone himself applauds or refuses to condemn acts of open dishonesty. We are to congratulate ourselves that duelling has ceased, but I do not know that men act more honourably because they can be called less sharply to account. Smuggling, we are told, has disappeared also, but the wrecker scuttles his ship or runs it ashore to cheat the insurance office. The church may perhaps be improved in the arrangement of the services and in the professional demonstrativeness of the clergy, but I am not sure that the clergy have more influence over the minds of men than they had fifty years ago, or that the doctrines which the Church teaches are more powerful over public opinion. One would not gather that our morality was so superior from the reports which we see in the newspapers, and girls now talk over novels which the ladies' maids of their grandmothers 
might have read in secret, but would have blushed while reading. Each age would do better if it studied its own faults and endeavoured to mend them, instead of comparing itself with others to its own advantage. Random meditations of this kind were sent flying through me by the newspaper articles on Tennyson and Mr. Gladstone. The air cleared, and my mind also, as we ran beyond the smoke. The fields were covered deep with snow. A white vapour clung along the ground, the winter sky shining through it soft and blue. The ponds and canals were hard frozen, and men were skating and boys were sliding, and all was brilliant and beautiful. The ladies of the forest, the birch trees beside the line about Farnborough, were hung with jewels of ice and glittered like a fretwork of purple and silver. It was like escaping out of a nightmare into happy healthy England once more. In the carriage with me were several gentlemen, officers going out to join their regiments, planters who had been at home on business, young sportsmen with rifles and cartridge cases who were hoping to shoot alligators, etc., all bound like myself for the West Indian mail steamer. The elders talked of sugar and of bounties and of the financial ruin of the islands. I had heard of this before I started, and I learnt little from them which I had not known already but I had misgivings whether I was not wandering off after all on a fool's errand. I did not want to shoot alligators. I did not understand cane growing or want to understand it, nor was I likely to find a remedy for encumbered and bankrupt landowners. I was at an age too when men grow unfit for roaming and are expected to stay quietly at home. Plato says that to travel to any profit, one should go between fifty and sixty, not sooner because one has one's duties to attend to as a citizen not after because the mind becomes hebetated. The chief object of going abroad, in Plato's opinion, is to converse with Theoi Andres inspired men, whom providence scatters about the globe, and from whom alone wisdom can be learnt. And I, alas, was long past the limit, and Theoi Andres are not to be met with in these times. But if not with inspired men, I might fall in at any rate with sensible men who would talk on things which I wanted to know. Winter and spring in a warm climate were pleasanter than a winter, and spring at home, and as there is compensation in all things, old people can see some objects more clearly than young people can see them. They have no interest of their own to mislead their perception. They have lived too long to believe in any formulas or theories. Old age, the Greek poet says, is not wholly a misfortune. Experience teaches things which the young know not. Old men at any rate like to think so. The Moselle, in which I had taken my passage, was a large steamer of 4,000 tons, one of the best where all are good, on the West Indian mail line. Her long straight sides and rounded bottom promised that she would roll, and I may say that the promise was faithfully kept, but except to the stomachs of the inexperienced rolling is no disadvantage. A vessel takes less water on board in a beam sea when she yields to the wave than when she stands up stiff and straight against it. The deck when I went on board was slippery with ice. There was the usual crowd and confusion before departure, those who were going out being undistinguishable, till the bell rang to clear the ship from the friends who had accompanied them to take leave. I discovered, however, to my satisfaction, that our party in the cabin would not be a large one. The West Indians who had come over for the colonial exhibition were most of them already gone. They, along with the rest, had taken back with them a consciousness that their visit had not been wholly in vain, and that the interest of the old country in her distant possessions seemed quickening into life once more. The commissioners from all our dependencies had been fated in the great towns, and the people had come to Kensington in millions to admire the productions which bore witness to the boundless resources of British territory. Had it been only a passing emotion of wonder and pride, or was it a prelude to a more energetic policy and active resolution. Anyway, it was something to be glad of. Receptions and public dinners and loyal speeches will not solve political problems, but they create the feeling of goodwill which underlies the useful consideration of them. The exhibition had served the purpose which it was intended for. The conference of delegates grew out of it which has discussed in the happiest temper the elements of our future relations. But the exhibition doors were now closed and the multitude of admirers or contributors were dispersed or dispersing to their homes. In the Moselle, we had only the latest lingerers, or the ordinary passengers,
who went to and fro on business or pleasure. I observed them with the curiosity with which one studies persons with whom one is to be shut up for weeks in involuntary intimacy. One young Demerara planter attracted my notice, as he had with him a newly married and beautiful wife whose fresh complexion would so soon fade, as it always does in those lands where nature is brilliant with colour and English cheeks grow pale. I found also to my surprise and pleasure a daughter of one of my oldest and dearest friends, who was going out to join her husband in Trinidad. This was a happy accident to start with, an announcement printed in Spanish in large letters in a conspicuous position intimated that I must be prepared for habits in some of our companions of a less agreeable kind. Se suplica a los señores pasajeros de no escupir sobre la cubierta de popa. I may as well leave the words untranslated, but the supplication is not unnecessary. The Spanish colonists, like their countrymen at home, smoke everywhere with the usual consequences. The captain of one of our mail boats found it necessary to read one of them, who disregarded it, a lesson which he would remember. He sent for the quartermaster with a bucket and a mop, and ordered him to stay by this gentleman and clean up till he had done. The wind when we started was light and keen from the north. The afternoon sky was clear and frosty. Southampton water was still as oil, and the sun went down crimson behind the brown woods of the new forest. Of the Moselle's speed we had instant evidence, for a fast government launch raced us for a mile or two, and off Netley gave up the chase. We went leisurely along, doing thirteen knots without effort, swept by Calshot into the Solent, and had cleared the needles before the last daylight had left us. In a few days the ice would be gone, and we should lie in the soft air of perennial summer. Singula de nobis ani predantur untes, eripuere jocos, venerem, convivia, ludum. But the flying years had not stolen from me the delight of finding myself once more upon the sea, the sea which is eternally young and gives one back one's own youth and buoyancy. Down the channel, the north wind still blew and the water was still smooth. We set our canvas at the needles and flew on for three days straight upon our course with a steady breeze. We crossed the bay without the fiddles on the dinner table. We were congratulating ourselves that, midwinter as it was, we should reach the tropics and never need them. I meanwhile made acquaintances among my West Indian fellow passengers and listened to their tale of grievances. The exhibition had been well enough in its way, but exhibitions would not fill an empty exchequer or restore ruined plantations. The mother country I found was still regarded as a stepmother, and from more than one quarter I heard a more than muttered wish that they could be taken into partnership by the Americans. They were wasting away under free trade and the sugar bounties. The mother country gave them fine words, but words were all. If they belonged to the United States, they would have the benefit of a close market in a country where there were 60 million sugar drinkers. Energetic Americans would come among them and establish new industries and would control the unmanageable Negroes. From the most loyal, I heard the despairing cry of the Britons. The barbarians drive us into the sea and the sea drives us back upon the barbarians. They could bear free trade which was fair all round, but not free trade which was made into a mockery by bounties, and it seemed that their masters in Downing Street answered them as the Romans answered our forefathers. We have many colonies and we shall not miss Britain. Britain is far off and must take care of herself. She brings us responsibility, and she brings us no revenue. We cannot tax Italy for the sake of Britons. We have given them our arms and our civilization. We have done enough. Let them do now what they can or please. Virtually this is what England says to the West Indians, or would say if despair made them actively troublesome, notwithstanding exhibitions and expansive sentiments. The answer from Rome we can now see was the voice of dying greatness, which was no longer worthy of the place in the world which it had made for itself in the days of its strength but it doubtless seemed reasonable enough at the time, and indeed was the only answer which the Rome of Honorius could give. A change in the weather cut short our conversations and drove half the company to their berths. On the fourth morning, the wind chopped back to the northwest. A beam sea set in, and the Moselle justified my conjectures about her. She rolled gunnel under, 
rolled at least forty degrees each way, and unshipped a boat out of her davits to windward. The waves were not as high as I have known the Atlantic produce when in the humour for it, but they were short, steep, and curling. Tons of water poured over the deck. The few of us who ventured below to dinner were hit by the dumb waiters which swung over our heads, and the living waiters staggered about with the dishes and upset the soup into our laps. Everybody was grumbling and miserable. Driven to my cabin, I was dozing on a sofa when I was jerked off and dropped upon the floor. The noise down below on these occasions is considerable. The steering chains clank, unfastened doors slam to and fro, plates and dishes and glass fall crashing at some lurch, which is heavier than usual, with the roar of the sea underneath as a constant accompaniment. When a wave strikes the ship full on the quarter and she staggers from stem to stern, one wonders how any construction of wood and iron can endure such blows without being shattered to fragments. And it would be shattered, as I heard an engineer once say, if the sea was not such a gentle creature after all. I crept up to the deckhouse to watch through the lee door the wild magnificence of the storm. Down came a great green wave, rushed in a flood over everything, and swept me drenched to the skin down the stairs into the cabin. I crawled to bed to escape cold, and slid up and down my berth like a shuttle at every roll of the ship, till I fell into the unconsciousness, which is a substitute for sleep, slept at last really, and woke at seven in the morning to find the sun shining, and the surface of the ocean still undulating but glassy calm. The only signs left of the tempest were the swallow-like petrels skimming to and fro in our wake, picking up the scraps of food and the plate washings which the cook's mate had thrown overboard. Smallest and beautifulest of all the gull tribe, called petrel by our ancestors, who went to their Bibles more often than we do for their images, in memory of St. Peter, because they seem for a moment to stand upon the water when they stoop upon any floating object. In the afternoon we passed the Azores, rising blue and fairy-like out of the ocean, unconscious they of the bloody battles which once went on under their shadows. There it was that Grenville, in the Revenge, fought through a long summer day alone against a host of enemies, and died there, and won immortal honour. The Azores themselves are Grenville's monument, and in the memory of Englishmen are associated forever with his glorious story. Behind these islands too lay Grenville's comrades, the English privateers, year after year waiting for Philip's plate fleet. Behind these islands lay French squadrons waiting for the English sugar ships. They are calm and silent now, and are never likely to echo any more to battle thunder. Men come and go and play out their little dramas, epic or tragic, and it matters nothing to nature. Their wild pranks leave no scars, and the decks are swept clean for the next comers.